Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our class, RBC 214 on developing the human spirit. And uh, we're going to, let's take a moment to pray, and then we will get started with our class. I'm sure the others will join in. I'm sorry for the delay in uh, putting the link to the class. Um, was a little delayed in doing that. So let's uh, pray. And then we will start. Could somebody lead us in prayer, please? Gracious Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we humble ourselves before you once again. Lord, uh, we submit this class into your mighty hands. We pray that you would teach us, you would lead us in your direction, and we would be able to follow and help us to understand the desires of your heart and move according to your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to um, continue from when we paused last week. Um, let me just go ahead and share the PDF that we were using. Uh, we were out in lesson number four, and we're talking about how the human spirit affects our soul and body. That means what we are experiencing spiritually in our spirit, what's in, in our spirit, whatever we're experiencing there has an effect on our mental or emotional self and also on our physical self, the body. Right? So we are going to just run through you know, several points that we see in the Bible. I'll highlight it, you know, we may not have time to delve into everything in depth, but we can easily see from these scriptures that uh, there are different kinds of things that we feel in the spirit, you know, what you feel spiritually. And what you feel spiritually then affects how you feel emotionally and physically, right? And, and so we will just kind of do a survey of scripture and see all this. Um, to get started, we saw in page uh, very first one, page uh, lesson number four. So my is switching here. <laughs> um, we saw there's uh, the anguish of spirit. That means there is uh, that feeling of anguish, brokenness, being crushed in the spirit, and therefore then people respond in a certain way, like they would not listen to Moses, or they, you know, they were the the soul was feeling better. So you can see anguish of the spirit. And you can see what this person was feeling in the soul, bitter in the soul. And uh, therefore, their behavior was complaining. So here, Job is going through this. You know, He's crushed in his spirit. His soul is feeling bitter. And so now, this is the expression. So you see the connection there. And like this, we'll see several things um, where uh, you can see some people, their spirit can be against God. Uh, it is, you know, for whatever reason. And even today when we meet some people, they could be angry against God. They could be hard against God. Uh, the spirit could be angry. People uh, are angry inside. And then out of that anger, they could do certain things. We saw in Acts 20.22, 20, Paul being bound in the spirit. That means he's feeling something in his spirit. You know, he's feeling tightness, restraint. Not, he's not feeling freedom and liberty. Uh, and the Holy Act is actually the Holy Spirit telling him, hey, when you go to Jerusalem, there are going to be things happening there. You know, you're going to be uh, killed, or basically you're going to be caught or arrested by the Jewish people. Uh, in Job 17, 1, Job says, my spirit is broken. That means he's feeling broken inside, you know, uh, in his spirit. And then he feels like, uh, okay, I'm I'm ready to die, you know. So can you can imagine? And this is something very important, you know. If people um, give up inside, you know, then uh, it, they have no more will to live, no more will to fight to live, you know. So now, last time we said, you know, brokenness can be expressed in different ways. Uh, sometimes we humble ourselves before God. So we become, we go before God with a broken and contrite spirit. Uh, sometimes the spirit is broken. 
uh, because um, there is sorrow, there is grief. You know, it could happen for many reasons, but typically you find that when somebody has lost a loved one, they're grieving and the sorrow of the heart could sometimes even put them in a place where they're broken. But some people are strong, they will go on, but some people it affects them uh, very badly. And what happens to a broken spirit? It says, Proverbs 17, 22, a broken spirit dries the bones. You know, so that means it affects the person physically. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, 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 whereas if, a, if the spirit of man is strong, it can carry him through sickness, even through difficult health conditions, can it through. So we see that, you know, how the importance, the, the strength of the spirit can affect how a person journeys through life. Uh, we see that um, there is what the Bible refers to in Isaiah 61, the spirit of heaviness. That means the spirit is weighed down. It's under burden. Some, you know, uh, some we commonly refer to this as depression. So the inner person is depressed. They are feeling under burden, and uh, you know they're low, they're down. You know, uh, but God says, "I want you to praise, even in a, um, as an antidote to the spirit of heaviness." Um, uh, you can uh, you can have, be a calm spirit. That means uh, it says in Proverbs 17, 27, a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. You know, just just maintaining uh, composure, and therefore he is able to manage, his, control his words, and walk with understanding. Uh, uh, we can be compelled in spirit. That means from within we are propelled into action. The spirit within us says. You have to do something. It moves us into action, which is a good thing if it's for you know for doing what the Lord calls us to do. Um, we can be people who are of di of a different spirit because we are bold, we are courageous. So you know, think about Caleb, Numbers fourteen twenty four. Uh, you know, everybody around were in unbelief, but Caleb said, "I can go do it." You know, I let's go, and we can conquer these giants. So. He was of a different spirit, and that's a good thing in that in that context. And we can have a spirit that is seeking uh, God. He says, you know, with my spirit within me, I will seek God early. So this is a spirit that is desiring, seeking, hungry for God. So even our desire for God comes from our hearts, from within us. Right? We can have a, you know, sometimes we can err, have error in spirit. That means our spirit has gone astray because of a lack of understanding, uh, because we have not been taught the right things. Uh, so Isaiah 29, 24 talks about those who are in error in spirit. So, uh, But then the antidote to that is for us to receive understanding and to learn doctrine, to learn the right things. We can, have pe we can be of an excellent spirit, like we see in the case of Daniel. Uh, you know, he was a man who was an, of an excellent spirit. That means he, he did things that were uh, very good that put him you know made him outstanding uh, in, in in how he conducted himself in his work and so on so we see that so if you if inside from inside you want to do what is ex, you know of uh, excellence that can be noticed now we have people who are of a faithful spirit that means these people are loyal they are um, they're faithful whether they are faithful to God or faithful to us you know, uh, that's important. So Malachi says, you know, we shouldn't, he says, take heed to your spirit. And that is watch over the inside, what's going on inside, so that you don't deal treacherously. Now, that means uh, unfaithfully. So uh, that's important there. So, you know, faithfulness is also from the spirit, that in your heart you're committed to be loyal, to be faithful. Um, it's there in scripture. We can also be fervent. In spirit, that means very zealous in spirit. So you'll find people from the inside, they are full, you know, so fully eager to serve God. And the Bible says we have to be fervent. That means you're always burning. We, we, we say, you know, that person is very zealous for the Lord. He's fervent in spirit. That zeal is from inside. They're really passionate uh, about serving God. We could be grieved in the spirit. That means. Uh, um, you know, uh, it's the spirit itself is feeling sorrowful. It's feeling 
um, uh, it's grieving you know, so, uh, it's in, in, within in, in grieving in spirit. So we see that uh, as an example. And then, of course, that affects the body. Uh, so you can, and Jesus groaned in the spirit when he was, when he saw the unbelief and saw the people, you know, troubled and disturbed uh, at the death of Lazarus. So in the spirit, he was disturbed, moved. Spirit could also be hardened. Uh, um, about Pharaoh, it says he will hard, you know, harden his heart, um, and uh, become stubborn in his heart. That means you are refusing to change, and uh, sometimes, and, and we see some many of the reasons there. It's because of pride being lifted up, so people can be stubborn inside, and unwilling to change. But in contrast, we can also be humble in spirit, and so being haughty in spirit, we can be uh, humble in spirit and uh, uh, of a humble spirit a lowly spirit that means walking walking in humility so that's also uh, uh, something that comes from within us in our spirit let's quickly go through uh, the rest uh, we could get impatient or hasty in spirit uh, we could be stirred up in our spirit Ezekiel calls it as being in the heat of, of the spirit that means it's really stirred up inside we could be inspired uh, you know, the, uh, in the spirit that God uh, imparts truth. Uh, he makes us know wisdom in the spirit through inspiration. Um, we can have a spirit that is searching and seeking. He says, my spirit makes diligent search. The spirit is searching out, looking for answers. Um, definitely, I'm going very fast. <laughs> I hope you can follow. Anyway, you can look at the notes afterwards. Um, we can uh, be, feel overwhelmed uh, in spirit. Uh, we could uh, see my spirit was overwhelmed within me. These are things that you feel in the spirit. And uh, then he says, my spirit fails. I feel like giving up. I feel like give it, quitting. You know? Or we can be patient in spirit. We can be perceiving. In spirit, that means our spirit is also seeing, understanding. Uh, we can uh, be pure in spirit, where there is no deceit. We can be revived in our spirit or refreshed in our spirit. Um, and uh, spirit was refreshed. I'm just hard pointing out various things. We can rejoice in the spirit. Spirit rejoices. Uh, we have a, We can have a spirit that is strong and governs us uh, uh, and uh, you know controls self-governing self-control comes from our spirit we have a spirit that is steadfast or firm resolute uh, we can have a spirit that is stirred up god can stir us up that is really you know move us in, in our spirit move us into action uh, we can be provoked agitated or even stirred into action in the spirit uh, we can be strong in the spirit strong in our inner man see several examples of that uh, and as we saw earlier we can also be disturbed in our spirit where you know sometimes the spirit becomes anxious or the spirit is troubled in, in a negative sense in one sense you know it is moved into action which is a positive thing but in another sense it can be troubled or disturbed more so of uh, not knowing what to do uh, and so on. So it can be troubled in spirit, no rest in my spirit. And our spirit can be willing. You know, that means the spirit is ready, ready to do what, what is required. Uh, but then the flesh could, you know, be not yet ready. And so we have to live out of the spirit. So... We went through all of these things very quickly. Uh, what I want to highlight is our human spirits can actually have all these experiences. You know, that means our human spirit could feel broken or be crushed or be hurt, be troubled or be disturbed, or it can be a place where God moves us, He provokes us, He he, you know, he inspires us. He gives us truth and wisdom. 
uh, and, and so on. So we see, you know, good things can happen in our spirit, where God is speaking to us, leading us, guiding us, truth is being imparted. We can also see that bad things could happen, you know. And so uh, having, uh, uh, having an understanding of this is important because we, we realize that the condition of our spirit then impacts our soul and body. And how you feel emotionally, physically, it's affected by how you are in the spirit, right? So our goal, therefore, is to maintain a strong, healthy, wholesome spirit. You know, so the key is, the key is, as uh, Proverbs four twenty two says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it come the issues of life. You know, Proverbs 4, 23. Guard your heart. Oh, verse 22, sorry. Guard your heart with all diligence, because out of it come the forces that shape your life or the issues of life. So our goal is to take care of our heart or our spirit very carefully. Right? So guard your heart, make it a priority. Right? So practically, how does that happen? I'll give some example. Suppose you know people say something, it hurts you. Immediately your thing must be, hey, I must prevent my spirit from getting hurt. You know, I must not let what that person said or what that person did. To affect my heart. We have no way to control what that person said or did or their behavior. No, we have no way to control that. You know, what they say is up to them, how they behave is up to them. But what we do have control over is we can prevent what they have said or done from hurting our spirit. You know, that is very important. You say, hey. I am going to guard my heart. I am not going to let what somebody said or did hurt me inside. You know, I'm going to protect my heart. I'm not going to let this get into my heart because I know that the condition of my spirit will affect me emotionally and physically. If I let what they say affect hurt me in my spirit, then I am going to be an injured person. So think about, you know, if somebody's physically injured. You know, uh, example, suppose we get physically injured, that means like we, we are not comfortable. We can't do certain things. Even if I cut my little finger here, I put a little band-aid here, you know, for, I won't be able to use this finger for some time. I can't, you know, I'm not so free and I feel the pain. It's, you know, it, is, it becomes a little difficulty. So, just as that's just a natural example, but if the spirit is hurt, if the spirit is wounded, then it affects the whole person. You know, so we have to guard our heart with all diligence. So in life, we are going to go through various experiences. You know, there will be experiences that bring sorrow, grief, uh, trouble, challenge. Um, hurt, all kinds of things. Life's ex you know, life, you're going through life, and all these things are happening around us. But we must guard our heart. Because you know, the condition of your spirit will affect your soul and your body, and it'll affect even how we relate to God. You know, so... Um, Protect your heart from everything that is negative. You know, protect your heart from any form of jealousy, any form of bitterness, any form of anger, uh, even any form of pride, arrogance, all these things, right? We have to guard our heart. And if we can keep our heart pure, guard it and keep it pure, Jesus put it like this, you know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So if you keep if we keep our heart pure, 
we are going to be able to have more and more revelation of God. We can see God clearly. You know, if if my heart is being affected by, you know, like we said, maybe it's hurt by what so and so said, or what this person did, or jealousy, or pride, or anger, or all these negative things. What happens? It blurs my vision of God. I can't see God properly and clearly through what I'm life situations. Right? So protecting your heart, keeping your heart pure is so important. You know? And one way that I find very useful is in the morning when I wake up, go before God in prayer, my first thing is I want to clear my heart. You know, if there is anything, I'm not saying it happens every day, but every now and then when something happens, my first thing is God creating me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me, like how David prayed. No? So we also pray, Lord, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me. You know, because I, I, I understand the importance of keeping my heart, my spirit, clean, strong, healthy, pure. Because if I can keep my spirit clean, strong, healthy, pure, it is going to take care of my soul and my body. You know, so that is very important. And we need to, you know, the best thing to do is go before God and say, Lord, I want my heart to be clean. Right? So we also evaluate our own selves. So God, is there any jealousy in me? Is there any pride in me? Oh God, take it out. I don't want um, the smallest trace of jealousy. I don't want the smallest trace of pride. I don't want the smallest trace of arrogance or hypocrisy. Uh, I don't want the smallest trace I don't want in my heart. Now, create in me a clean heart. Maintain, help me to maintain a right spirit. Yeah. If I can do that, a lot of things will be taken care of. Yeah. So understand, understand this important truth and always maintain strong, healthy, wholesome spirit within you. Right? And the other aspect here I just mentioned, 2 Corinthians 4 17, is uh, you know, do not lose heart. So that means when when things there will be challenges, there will be things that challenge our faith in God, our trust in God. Uh, but we keep our heart full of strength. Keep your inner man strong, feeding it with the word, feeding it in prayer. Keep your inner man strong so that even though the outward man is growing old, the inward man is being renewed. Right? So the inward man is recharging its strength day after day, even though outward man is uh, decaying. Having said that, I want to point us to a couple of things. One is, we must understand the importance of words. That words affect our spirit, the human spirit. Proverbs 15.4 says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Yeah. That means, uh, he's saying, if there is a perverse tongue, or, or let's say a wholesome tongue, that's a healthy tongue, is a tree of life. It is, it gives life to the whole person. But if the tongue itself is wicked, it's crooked, it's not straight, it's not right, then it crushes the spirit. That means words affect our spirit. You know. Uh, the words we hear, and even the words we speak, and which our own ears hear. You know, so there are words that people speak to us. So we need to protect ourselves. Don't let those words get into your heart if they are if they are, you know, uh, um, wrong words. If they are healthy, encouraging, godly words, yeah, you receive. But when people speak things, don't let it get into your heart, because it, it says it can break the spirit. You know those words. So we have to guard ourselves. You know when people are saying things, uh, where they may say, you know, even in, a, in in jest, as a joke, they might say something. But if you're not careful, those that word, those words which they were saying in a joke or jokingly, 
can get into somebody's heart and just break their spirit you know or uh, we have to be careful with our own words you know our own words can break our own spirit meaning if i keep speaking words of defeat if i keep speaking words that uh, uh, that say oh i cannot do anything i'm a useless fellow i cannot i have no strength i am this like I, I i'm breaking my own spirits you know because the bible says crooked words can break the spirit you know so i must have a wholesome tongue i need to have a tongue that speaks healthy words good words then it will be a tree of life to my own self it will strengthen my own self so understand this very important principle the principle of words and how words affect our spirit and therefore two things we ourselves can speak wholesome words and we also have to be careful on what words we entertain into our hearts if we entertain the wrong words and let it get inside us it can destroy our spirit right so be very careful you know when you listen to people and what they're saying last one last section here is very interesting and that is the human spirit is compared in the bible to different um, using different analogies that means the bible is saying the spirit of man is like this and it's giving us a comparison so we've tried to list down some of those things first we see the spirit of man is like a house yeah. so a house means it is where someone lives it's a dwelling place so our spirit is like a house or we can say uh, uh, a temple like you know temple so the human spirit is a dwelling place and it's designed to be a dwelling place for the lord for god himself mm -hmm. so it could it's a, it's a place of habitation now it could be inhabited by evil spirits or it could be inhabited by the holy spirit you know so you know in genesis 4 7 god tells cain cain sin is waiting at your door and it's trying to get in so this is sin personified that means it's an unclean spirit an evil spirit and in this case of really a spirit of murder it's waiting to get into him cain and you know we saw we know what happened you know when cain got angry that whole that spirit of murder was waiting to get into him and eventually it did and he went and murdered his brother Abel. But at that point, God was warning him. He said, Cain, you know, sin is at the door. Sin is at the door. It's waiting to get in. Matthew 12, Jesus ex explains, you know, how an evil spirit is dwelling inside a person. When it is cast out, it goes and gets seven other wicked spirits, comes back. It sees the house clean. So that means the spirit is like a house, the spirit of man is like a house. And it's now in this particular case, it's being inhabited by evil spirits. But the good side is our spirit is inhabited by the Holy Spirit Himself as believers. You know? So God the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. And so the spirit is a house. That's how we can say, oh God, fill me. Oh God, dwell in me. Oh God, right? Your house is, your spirit is like a house. You want God to, you know, just fill the house. God, make yourself comfortable. We want you. God, we just want you to inhabit, inhabit me, fill me. Yeah? So you're praying like that. Why? Because your spirit is like a house. Second, we see in the Bible that the spirit is like a lamp. Again, these are comparisons, analogies that God uses. It tells us something. What does a lamp do? A lamp gives light to guide us. You know, so the spirit of man is like a lamp. Proverbs 20, 27 says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Yeah? 
the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord. So when you light a candle, okay, you put a candle there, you want light in the room, you light the candle. You know, so Proverbs 20, 27 says, the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord and he lighteth it. That means God, it's like, you know, he strikes the match, he gives the light to that candle. Right? Law, Psalm 18, 28, the Lord will light my candle. Psalm 18, 28, God himself will enlighten. So the spirit of man is like a candle or a lamp. And those are old, today we might say, it's like a torchlight or something that gives light through, from which we get clarity and guidance and direction. So your spirit is a lamp that God enlightens in order to give us direction. So very interesting. What must we do? When we need guidance, remember, the lamp is inside you. The candle is inside you. You say, God, it's so dark, I can't see, I need some light. Okay, candle is inside you. Now, of course, one is, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Right? So look, look into the word of God. His word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. One thing, that's important. Second, your own spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to light up the lamp. Right? So that's another place where you, you and I are going to receive guidance. The human spirit is like a lamp. So that means in that place, in your spirit, God is going to guide you. That's why, you know, Romans 8, 16, Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Hmm? Holy Spirit is going to light up our spirit. He's going to bear witness. He's going to give us guidance in our spirit. Okay? So, when we need guidance, first we go to the Word of God. Second, look into the Spirit, your Spirit. Because your Spirit is a candle. God will give you light there to give you guidance. Okay? Spirit is like a lamp. The third thing uh, we see in the Bible is that the Spirit is a place of deposit. So in modern way, if you want to think about it, it's like a bank account. It's a place of deposit. We see this in Matthew 12, 34 and 35. You know, Jesus says, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, that means he's got a good deposit in his heart. So the heart is a place of deposit. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, will bring forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, will bring forth evil things. And then Jesus also said, out of the abundance of the heart, what, the, what you've got deposited there, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? So, the heart is the place where we deposit treasure, where we put things. And what we put there in our heart will then influence our life. So Jesus, when does, from where does, you know, in that same passage, from where does, uh, you know, a man do evil things, you know, the, uh, all the evil things he does, where does it come from? It comes from his heart. Right? But then the positive is also true. From where do all the good things come from? Well, it comes from the person's heart. If the person has got good deposit in their heart, then good things will begin to come out. Right? So what we deposit in our heart will then begin to come forth in our life. Uh, it will come forth in our word. It will come forth in our deed. So deposit, a place of deposit. So we are saying analogies of the human spirit. It's giving us some insight how we should deal with our spirit. It's a house. It's a place of God's habitation. It's a lamp. It's a place of God's instruction. It's a place of deposit. It's a place where God is going to pour out, where we should desire for God to pour out His revelation, His knowledge, His wisdom, and His truth, because that is what we want to come out of our lives. Right? So the heart is a place of deposit. Let me pause and see if everybody's following me. I've been going very fast. Um, is everybody following me? It's possible. Okay, good, good. Yes, Pastor. 
Okay, great. Okay, thank you. I was just talking quite continuously. I just wanted to make sure you're with me, right? So let's go forward. Thank you. All right, so the heart is a place of deposit. Another interesting thing is the heart is a spring. This is in Proverbs 4, 20 to 22. You know, God is telling in Proverbs 4, he says, My son, attend to my words, incline your ear to my sayings, let them not depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart, for their life to those who find them, health to all their flesh. Verse 23, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it come the forces, or comes the issues that, that the issues of life, or it's the place where the matters of life spring out of. So the picture there is like a spring that flows out into your life. So where does it come from? It says, guard your heart, for out of it spring the forces that shape your life. You know? So if I guard my heart, make sure my heart is clean, make sure that what I'm putting into my heart is good, then the spring that comes out will be good. The forces that shape my life will be good. So think about this. Your heart is a spring. And what is in your heart is what's going to shape your life, not the forces around you. You know, this was very encouraging to me, especially in my early years. Um, there, there'll be all kinds of things around me, right? But I would tell myself, you know, what is really shaping my life? It's not all these things around me. Of course, there is all these factors around me. But what God has said that really shapes my life is what is springing out of my heart. So if I just focus on that, if I just focus to make sure that what is coming out of my heart is good, my life is going to be shaped with good things. You know, of course, around me, there could be all kinds of things happening which are outside of my control. You know, we don't control how people behave, what the politicians say, and what government does, and what people do. We don't control all those things. What we do have control over is what springs out of our heart. And that is what finally shapes our lives. Because Jesus said, uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, out of your heart come the spring, springs of life, or it comes the waters that shape your life out of your heart. You know, so that's an important thing. The spirit is compared to a spring. Another thing, very interesting, is the spirit is compared to a womb. John seven thirty-seven to thirty-nine. Um, and in verse thirty-nine, Jesus, uh, Jesus says, "Sorry, verse thirty-eight, Jesus says." Out of his innermost being, some versions will translate that, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Hmm? And very interesting, if you look up that word in the Greek, which, you know, like we said, in the English is translated innermost being or belly. In the Greek, it, one of the meanings of that word is it is the womb, out of the womb. And then it says, He's talking about the heart. So the heart is like a womb. It's like the place where we give birth and bring forth. So that means the things that we birth in life are first born, conceived, and built up and nurtured in our spirit. So if, and that is a very important truth also. If I can conceive and I can develop in my spirit, then I can birth it into my life. Because your spirit is like a womb. Yeah. So I, I go back to this thing. Okay, What do I want to birth? Well, if I want to birth something, then I make sure I go through the conception and uh, you know, uh, d development process in the womb of my spirit. And if when that happens and when I'm ready, I can birth it. 
because the spirit is like a womb. So be engaged with the Holy Spirit, be engaged with the Word of God, because it is God who will birth it in our spirit. It's God who will form it in our spirit. It's of course in, in it taking place in a spiritual manner, but God is shaping it. And then at the right time, He causes it to come forth and it is released on the earth. You know, so any work that God wants us to do, any ministry, any work, any you know, whatever we want to birth in this world for the kingdom of God, it should first be born in the womb of our spirit through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit. And then it develops in our spirit, and then we release it into the earth. So the spirit is like a womb, and that is where God begins to form his work and release it. A few other things we also see. That the spirit is like a ground. Uh, we saw this in the parable of the sower. He said the sower sows the word, and the word falls on the heart. Yeah. So the heart is like a field or a ground where we can sow seed and reap a harvest. Okay? Now, very again, I want to emphasize it. Nobody can stop that. If we want to receive a harvest of any kind of harvest. We just sow the seed and nurture it. Where? In our spirit. Okay? So if you want to receive a seed, example, for healing, a seed for God's uh, provision, a seed for whatever the harvest, sorry, whatever the harvest we need, well, we know how to do it. Your, your heart is the ground. You sow the seed, you water it, you nurture it, you will have the harvest, and nobody can stop that. Two more things. The heart are like tables on which things can be written. You know, Paul said, You are an epistle written by us, not on tables of stone, but on tables of the flesh, written by the spirit. That means uh, you know, if you want in modern language, we can say our heart is uh, the paper on which you know God writes by his Holy Spirit. That means it is in our spirit that truth and revelation is written. So when we are ministering to people, our desire is that the truth of God be written in their hearts, not just in their minds, in their minds, of course, they have to understand it. But we want to go beyond the mind and we want it to be written in the heart. And so what is written indelibly in your spirit is what is going to stay with you for life. You know, so we must receive the word into our hearts. We must let God's truth be written in our hearts. That will, will stay with us for life. And finally, I know I'm running against time here, um, but we also see that the human spirit is like a vessel. A vessel means it's a container. You know, it's a container. We can only pour out. God has poured in. You know, we can only pour out, we can only give to others what we have let God pour into us. You know, so as a vessel, we go before God and say, God, pour into my spirit. You know, then we are able to pour that out to other people. Okay? So we're going to pause here. And uh, I want us to take some time, just think about these things, reflect on this. Your spirit is like a house, God dwells there. Your spirit is like a lamp, God gives you guidance and instruction, revelation there. Your spirit is like a place of deposit. If you deposit the word of God there, you can draw out of it, it'll come into your life. Your spirit is like a spring from which the waters that shape your life come. Your spirit is like a womb. Uh, you know, Whatever you want to give birth to, it has to be put formed and developed there. Your spirit is like a ground or field. What a harvest you want, you can sow, water, nurture, and then reap from there. Your spirit is like a, let, um, a writing pad. That's where God writes, and uh, it will stay with you for life. Your spirit is like a vessel. Whatever you, f you are full of, you can pour out into others. You know? So our spirit is so important. Yeah. Okay? All right. Any questions from anybody?
I'm sorry, I took the whole time. Uh, well, okay. Okay, I hope uh, you would uh, take some time to reflect on this and, uh, and so we can present ourselves and take care of our spirit from there, God will do a powerful work. Okay, let's close in prayer for today. May somebody please lead us in prayer and we can close. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your beautiful spirit that you have given us, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, you are amazing the way you have created us, the way you have thought about us. Every single thought of yours is amazing, Lord. We are so thankful that you chased us down, you found us, and we know that you are our Savior, you are the real God. Thank you, God. We thank you a million times. And God, as we are studying about our spirit, help us to take care of our spirit. Help us to give you the best place. It's a place where you are living in Jesus. Help us to grow in our spirit each and every day as you did when you were down here on this earth. Help us to guard our heart above all else, Lord. Teach us, guide us. Tell us which thoughts to take in and which thoughts we should never take into our spirit. Help us to protect our spirit above all else, Jesus. Because what we write on our spirit, it's going to stay with us forever. Help us to write your words in our heart, Lord. Every single day as we read our Bible, as we meditate on it, help us to sink your words deep into our hearts so that nothing in this life can break us, so that none of the plans of devils will succeed. But we will live an amazing life for you. But so that what is in our spirit will be poured out as a blessing to others. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being on the class. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.